Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, February 1st, and we are going to talk about the movie, The Human Stain with Rabbi Ike Serrata. Take it away, Rabbi. Hi. It's, thank you, Vanessa. It's nice to see you and nice to see everybody on the call, whether uh, you're live or just your names on the screen. It's always nice to see you all. So uh, I'm glad you could join us. I hope you got a chance to screen the movie. Uh, it's from 2003, which, uh, you know, sometimes I, I'm sure we all have this experience of looking at it. So really, it's, it's, you know, 19 years old, right? Uh, it's, you know, kind of hard to uh, believe that time goes by that quickly sometimes. Uh, it's based on a novel by Philip Roth. And if you haven't read the novel, I, I would certainly encourage you, though, of course, you now all know the twist, right, uh, that, 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 you know, is, is sort of hidden until three quarters of the way through the novel or so. Um, but of course, it's very hard to take a, a novel, which, uh, you know, takes hours to, um, you know, to read through the whole thing uh, and condense it down into a, a movie screenplay that can only be a couple of hours long. Uh, I would say that, that you know, in, in uh, the last couple of years when, um, you know, novels have seemed like uh, they might benefit from a longer format. Uh, you know, you're seeing miniseries and things like that based on a novel. This book might have uh, uh, done well in terms of, um, uh, you know, being more of a miniseries than it does in just a couple of hours. Uh, it goes by quick and uh, a lot of things have to be condensed. And, um, you know, it's uh, it, it might have uh, um, worked well in a longer form setting. If, if you haven't seen it, I'll recommend a Philip Roth book in a longer form setting, The Plot Against America, um, which uh, I think was a six episode miniseries uh, from last year. Uh, it's a good example of how, how you can uh, really get a novel, give it the, the, the depth and the spread that it needs to, to take its, uh, to play out all of its characters. So, um, I, I have my own little story about Philip Roth uh, that just mentioned. Uh, I am actually in one of Philip Roth's books. Uh, some of you may have heard me tell this story. But um, uh, I, when I was a student in New York in rabbinic school, my student pulpit was in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And I went there. I met an uh, older gentleman at my first own egg there and um, got to talking to him and asked uh, about his family. And he said he had two sons. And he told me about uh, one son. He said, the other son is a writer. And I said, well, has he written anything I might have heard of? And he said, goodbye, Columbus. And I said, oh, yeah, I, I think I've heard of that one. Right. So uh, so I, uh, I was Herman Roth's rabbi. So I have several books on my shelf of books by Philip Roth, autographed by Herman Roth. Uh, but after his father died, Philip Roth wrote a book about his father called Patrimony, which actually is one of my favorite Philip Roth books. And not only because um, there's a mention of a young rabbinic student who visits his father in the hospital, um, and, that, and that's me. So, but that's not the only reason I like the book. Uh, and the young rabbinic student is actually a composite character because when his father died, um, that was the next year, and there was already another student in that pulpit. So, um, so either Philip Roth didn't realize that we were two different people, or he uh, um, uh, decided to make us a composite. But either way, it's very nice. And so, uh, the nice young, compassionate rabbinic student—that was me. So, uh, so if you ever want to read Patrimony, um, but anyhow. Uh, so it's this book, *The Human Stain*, uh, by Philip Roth. Terrific book. It's uh, the screenplay was written by Nicholas Meyer, um, who uh, is uh, uh, also Jewish, uh, born in 1945. And um, uh, you may have seen some of his other work. Um, he wrote uh, several books, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes books, actually. And one of them, uh, he also wrote the screenplay for, was called The 7% Solution. And I think it became his uh, de directorial debut as well. So he is actually not only uh, written for the movies, but directed as well. He directed a, a, a pretty good time travel movie uh, a couple of years after the 7% Solution called Time After Time. Uh, I haven't seen it in many years, but I'll bet it still holds up. Uh, pretty good movie. 
he directed a couple of the Star Trek movies in the original uh, uh, Star Trek movie series, the ones that, that starred William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy. So um, um, both of whom, of course, are Jewish, as was the creator of Star Trek, uh, Gene Roddenberry. Um, so he wrote this screenplay as well. And uh, it's directed by Robert Benton. And I have to admit, I, I probably uh, thought that Robert Benton was Jewish because we have a member of the congregation, Bob Benton. So uh, I, I think I conflated the two a little bit uh, because uh, I'm pretty sure now that Robert Benton is not Jewish. He was born in 1932. Uh, he's uh, still around and uh, I don't know that he's directing anymore because uh, it's well into his 80s, but he's been around since the 1960s in, in the movie business. Uh, he actually was nominated for an Oscar. I think the first Oscar he was nominated for was as a screenwriter for um, Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, 1967, maybe. And then um, as a, a writer and director, he's better known for other things than The Human Stain. He's probably best known for um, uh, Kramer versus Kramer which he wrote and directed and got uh, Oscars, won the Oscar, I think, both for screenplay, adapted screenplay, because that comes from a novel as well, and uh, best director. Uh, and he's been nominated a couple of other times, and I think maybe won another Oscar for his script for the movie Places in the Heart. Um, he also uh, directed Paul Newman in a movie called Nobody's Fool, I uh, directed Dustin Hoffman, I think, in the movie Billy Bathgate, uh, as well as Kramer versus Kramer. So, um, so it, you know, so the, these are uh, two old pros, I guess I'd say, about Nicholas Mayer and Robert Benton. Um, I, I guess we should make mention that this was a Miramax production, which means that uh, it was produced by Harvey Weinstein. Um, so, uh, which, you know, up until a certain point of time, we might say, oh, a Jewish producer, isn't that great? You know, but obviously, uh, you know, um, not so much anymore. It's not how we think of him uh, uh, after the Me Too movement uh, got started and really, in a way, got started with the accusations against Harvey Weinstein. So, um so he does have a brother who was also involved in Miramax and apparently maybe isn't as bad a guy as Harvey. So I, I guess maybe we can say that because uh, no accusations have been filed against the brother. Are uh, you sure? I'm pretty sure he was complicit. But, well, you know, I'm look, I, I mean, the hundreds of people at least were complicit, right? Yeah. I'm, you know, the people who knew and looked away, you know, but it is interesting that nobody has accused the brother, I don't think you know, of anything. So, um, but it's hard to imagine he didn't know, right? Uh, at any rate, uh, so that that's the team behind the making of the movie. Uh, uh, mention a little bit about the cast. Uh, the, the, the four main characters, uh, I probably don't need much introduction from me. I mean, I don't think I have to tell you about Anthony Hopkins or Nicole Kidman. Uh, probably not Ed Harris or Gary Sinise either. I mean, uh, Gary Sinise, of course, has uh, Chicago roots, uh, was, was a member of uh, um, uh, the Steppenwolf Company uh, and has appeared many times in, in Chicago theater, uh, even in more recent years, you know, has come back and appeared at, in, in things at Steppenwolf. Um, uh, his probably big break in the movies was uh, Forrest Gump. Um, so where he plays Lieutenant Dan uh, in Forrest Gump. Um, Ed Harris, is, of course, has been in many movies uh, over the years. Uh, he was in the movie about the artist Jackson Pollock several years ago. He plays, uh, I think he plays John Glenn, doesn't he, in The Right Stuff? Um, so, and, and many other roles over the years. And uh, um, both of them, I think, are very good in this film. Um, you know, and Anthony Hopkins and Nicole Kidman are, are as good as they can be in this movie. I, I would say from my point of view that they're both miscast. Um, you know, I, I, th this is, uh, again, probably something that's uh, the part of changing Hollywood, right? That um, I'm not sure that you would, uh, if you were making this movie again today, would you cast um, someone like Anthony Hopkins playing a black man pretending to be a Jew. 
So uh, probably not, right? Um, so that's, uh, uh, you know, I think he's, he's a fine actor uh, and the part of the character, which is a professor of classics at a university, he's right for that part of the role. Uh, it's the rest of it that I have some question with. And um, uh, I don't know how, to, how else to say it about Nicole Kidman, except that the, when you read the book, I'm not sure you picture Nicole Kidman in the role. Uh, um, she's, she's too young and, uh, you know, um, what can I say? She's too beautiful for the, the part, actually. So, uh, so she's fighting an uphill battle, in a sense, to in, inhabit the character, I think, a little bit. Now, I may be prejudiced about that from having read the book and, and uh, you know, picturing my own picture of who that is. But, uh, but I will say that a lot of other people writing about this movie over the years have uh, agreed that uh, with the question of, of miscasting, and that was before it even was the question of whether it was, uh, uh, um, shouldn't you cast uh, um, an African-American uh, actor in the role? You know? uh, on the other hand, you have to find, you know, uh, it, it's not a role that Sidney Poitier could have played, right? So it, it's sort of an interesting problem in casting, actually. Um, uh, which, interestingly enough, and one of the reasons I, I picked this movie is really uh, it, is that, I mean, this question of, of casting and what we call now blind casting and, um, you know, that anybody can play anything. Well, not exactly, right? So, um, so the, there's some interesting issues there. I also uh, chose it in part because there's a movie this year that will probably be nominated for a few Oscars in the, the weeks to come that's worth seeing. Doesn't really have Jewish uh, content, but it's called Passing. Uh, and it's I, 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 it's either Netflix or Amazon. I don't, I don't remember which one, but so you, you know, if you haven't watched it, I certainly recommend it. It's, it's a good film. And I suspect it will get several Oscar nominations in the next few weeks. But so I thought The Human Stain might be a little timely um, in, in terms of that as well. I do want to mention some of the minor actors, uh, actors in minor parts in this movie, some of whom were really just kind of getting their start uh, in movies. And some of them are long time uh, um, character actors, but uh, just mention a couple of them um, whose faces may have looked familiar. Um, Kerry Washington, who uh, go goes on to be quite, gets quite famous over the last few years. I think it, didn't she star in that TV series, How to Get Away with Murder? I think that was what it was called. That's not no, what it's called. That, that, that was another black actress. She was in, um, I'll look it up, but okay. here's, here's her picture. To, she's certainly uh, become much better known over the years and she appears in this movie in a very small part, just as a record store clerk. Right to uh, um, you know, kind of recognizes him when he come, comes in in one of the flashbacks. Uh, the the other a couple of others that you probably recognize uh, the attorney that he goes to visit um, is, is a guy named Clark Gregg, who uh, appears uh, in several of the Marvel movies as an agent of Shield in uh in marvel movies and i think uh stars in a marvel tv series as well um so uh margo gary, Wa gary washington was in scandal thank you alice um, thank you uh margo martindale is uh plays the uh psychologist um uh in this movie Right, and uh, and she's in a in a lot of things. Uh, you know, I, I see her all the time in everything. From I think she had a recurring role in the uh, uh, in BoJack Horseman, the animated series. She was also in a, um, a show called The Leftovers um, on I think HBO a number of years ago, and just shows up often uh, as a as a character actress. Uh, a couple of other people may look familiar. Um, uh, um, you know, the, they've gone on to some other roles and things like that. Um, maybe not as familiar as some of the others, but uh, the the actress who plays uh, 
his nemesis at the college, um, uh, Delphine Rue, uh, is played by an actress named Mimi Kuzik, whose uh, face is very familiar. Um, the the actress who plays uh, his mother, Anna Devere Smith, has, has been in many, many things. And the father, too, Mr. and Mrs. Selk, Harry Lennox, uh, has been in uh, lots of things. So, um, uh, and um, the the girlfriend of the young Coleman, Stina, Jacinda Barrett. Uh, so all of these folks have gone on to uh, more roles and uh, become perhaps more familiar faces in um, more recent years right, than they were at the time this movie was made. Uh, Wentworth Miller, who plays the young Coleman Silk, also is uh, um, has been in, uh, the star of this series, Prison Break. Uh, which uh, I never watched, but was on for many, many years, apparently. So, um, so, and uh, say perhaps a better choice, you know, as the young Coleman Silk than uh, than Anthony uh, um, Hopkins is as the older Coleman Silk. Uh, Wentworth Miller uh, is of mixed race heritage, but but of course that's not really the character either, right? I'm mean, so. It's a, so I'm not sure there's an actor in Hollywood that, that would actually fit this um, physical description, uh, which uh, some critics of the movie have, have said makes the whole thing far-fetched to begin with. But there's no question that over the, the years, there are many people who have uh, passed, you know, in, in our culture. But, but finding someone in Hollywood who is actually an African-American actor who could pass as a uh, Jewish classics professor, I'm, you know, this is, this is a very small category, uh, if there are any, right, you know, that, that fall into this category. So, uh, so you can quibble, but it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. So I want to talk a little bit about the title itself, The Human Stain, because I think that that's... Uh, open for some interpretation and discussion and uh, worth thinking about. You know, it, it's certainly not something that gets mentioned in in the movie, all right? There isn't sort of, a, a, you know, sometimes the title of a play or a movie or something is actually a line in the movie. But uh, uh, I don't recall seeing it in the book and I don't, uh, I certainly didn't hear it in the movie. So, uh, uh, except uh, at the end, right in the ice fishing scene, at the end, he um, um, Zuckerman says that he's writing a book called *The Human Stain*. Um, you know, it's not finished yet, but I'll send you a copy. He says to Ed Harris's character. So, um, so it's uh, that's the only time it's mentioned. So, so what are we talking about? I mean, is, is this uh, a, a comment on on skin? Is, is human, you know, the color of human skin, is that, that a part of what this is, right? It's um, uh, perhaps so. Um, is it the imprint that we leave on the things that we touch or the things that, that um, stain our skin through experience, right? I mean, the scars. Uh, and I think, um, I think we, we see some stuff about the scars on Fania's wrists i believe right uh, at one point in the movie so um so there there's several different ways uh, of thinking about it uh, i see susan has a hand up and i i'm interested in hearing what people are thinking about the title so sue you keep there we go all right um well i don't i didn't look at the title as being um about physical stain Mm -hmm. I thought it more that his character was stained yeah. because he was so dishonest. Right. Uh, and in some ways, he was even being dishonest to himself. Yeah. And um, I mean, to think that he he engaged in a marriage and <laughs> never, you know, told his wife, uh, it, it just... I felt that it, it was his character that was stained. Anyway, to yeah. Make, make yeah. It. yeah, there's a line near the end where it says, "I wanted to be free, but I became a prisoner." Mm -hmm. Right? You know that the, how he he uh, in in trying to get out of a certain box, he put himself even more firmly into a different one. Right? You know, mm -hmm. 
uh, and of course loses his job uh, over it, you know? So, um, so I, I see some other hands. Uh, Mary, you wanna? You have to unmute, Mary. Unmute. Yeah. There you go. I unmuted you. Thank yeah. you. I agree with Susan because I think that the human stain is the fact that he 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 kept a secret from his wife, but also from his first girlfriend. Can you imagine to going to see your maybe mother-in-law and not even know she's black? Yeah. I mean that whole scene and with her on the train. I mean he he really let her down. He didn't mm -hmm. support her. Yeah. And he didn't let her in, which tells you, you know. And I think so that I agree that that's kind of the human stain for him is an inability to be honest with the world and even himself. Yeah. Probably that's why he quit. I mean, I don't know. But is he the only one with uh, I mean, oh, I would no. say no. That, that everybody in the in the film on, on some level or another is dealing with that human right. stain, right? right. Uh, right. So yes. the things that we do and the things that are done to us both. Okay. Leave their marks, you know. So uh, Sandy uh, has a hand up. Yeah, if you remember his mother, who I thought was a wonderful actress, mm -hmm. his mother called him her golden boy. She yeah. said, "You were you were golden," and mm -hmm. she knew he was different. His color was different than the rest of the children. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the use of the word golden there is is kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, you know, uh, in another, uh, you know, in another context, we might not think about that and how it relates to the the color of the 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 character. But but in this situation, I think you have to reflect on that as well, right? So, seeing some more hands, uh, uh, Julie. Uh, Julie, and then um, Linda. Oh, I. I felt like the title to me uh, was a commentary on his, on, on the lead character being stained by ra ra his own racism against his own race. And, and the sort of the, how that was, how that is in dialogue with the fact that he's accused of racism, right. and even, you know, all of those things to me, if that was sort of what brought that, it brought that all of the subplot and the plot together. Was, yeah. The fact that was Isn't that interesting in itself, right? That the thing he's accused of being racist about is not the thing he's racist about, right? I mean, you know, the use uh, of the word that he uses in, in that first scene is, is certainly not intended in a racial way. He's not thinking about it in a racial way. He doesn't know that those students are African-American. Um, you know, so the sort of trumped up charge of racism is, is wrong. But what he feels in his heart, you know, right, that he that he uh, leaves his race behind, leaves his family, right? I, I mean, there, there's certainly, uh, um, you know, a, a racist element in that, right? You know, so it, it it's it's really fascinating, you know, and and um, you know, I, I love the way the movie plays with that, and the and the book as well, right? And and so much of that in the in the book, even more strongly than the movie, is that as a classics professor, right? Now this is an issue too, right? This has been a big issue on on university campuses, and certainly it was when Philip Roth wrote the book too. How much of those classics should we still be teaching, right? And uh, who are we leaving out of the curriculum? When um, when everything you know comes from a white Eurocentric point of view, you know, so uh, so th that's certainly one one of the axes that Philip Roth had to grind, and and maybe the movie lightens that up a little bit. It's one of the things that it can't go into the depth that the book does, but the precision of language uh, is uh, is a big issue in the book. You know? so Linda what's next. Uh, I really enjoyed the book, I mean the movie, and uh, what what I came away with from The Human Stain was the, uh, the, I'm trying to get the right word, of all the main characters and how they were all, not broken, but they all had issues, yeah. and that's why he was um, 
uh, he went to them. Yeah. He went to them because he could relate that they had issues too. Right. Not, not exactly like his. I mean, similar. They both, the other two, Gary Sinise's uh, Zuckerman and this gal, um, they both walked away from their family like he did. Mm -hmm. And that they were walking around with this albatross of guilt on their around yeah. them. And so that's how I saw it. And that's how I felt that I could relate to it. Because um, everyone has guilt in their life. That they're sorry they didn't do something or they didn't say something at some time. Or they have not acknowledged someone. And yeah. so that's what I was seeing with the human statement that they all left their stain on the world or on someone else. Yeah, very nice. And of course, uh, the ex-husband too, you know, who's yeah. deal certainly dealing with PTSD and the things that happened in Vietnam and uh, those sorts of things, uh, uh, you know. So uh, so maybe broken is the right word, Linda, that, that you used, you know. Um, but especially in the sense that we might think of all human beings as having a certain amount of brokenness. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Leonard Cohen in one of his songs talks about the, the broken places are important because that's where the light gets in, you know. Um, so, you know, to be human in, in some sense is, is to be broken, right? And that's, uh, that's the human stain, you know, perhaps. Um, the, in our healing service each month, we have a poem by uh, uh, the poet Danny Siegel which uh, talks about um, uh, the spirituality of imperfection in the world. And it, it talks about the, uh, the, the, the Shabbos, the stains on the Shabbos silverware, right? Uh, you know, signs of, of the imperfection of the universe. So, uh, so it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting line, right? Um, but yeah, so and, and so many of the characters, uh, certainly the major characters, all have that uh, kind of brokenness they're dealing with. Uh, I lost track of. I, I see. It's oh, um, it, one more yeah, thing. I think it's Marilyn then Miriam. Um, put, put Linda back in line. I think she had something else. She I, okay. I had one other thing that I wanted to mention yeah. that I believe that um, the wife. Who had a very small part wasn't that phyllis newman uh, i think it might have been yeah and that's who i recognized it i just wanted to interject that i didn't yeah. see her name mentioned but i'm sorry okay great okay marilyn yes i think um i love the fact that um the word stain was used because it reflected so much of what was going on in the world at that time with President Clinton and the stain that he left on Lewinsky's clothing and, um, you know, that stained us so deeply in so many ways. We were all affected by that uh, poor judgment. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes a stain um, can't be erased. And so I don't care how long he lived and what his life would have been, he could never have erased the stain that he imposed on his own self because yeah. he didn't even admit when he could have protected himself that he too was a black American and saved his job. And I think a lot of it had to do with his upbringing, his father portrayed such a brilliant, uh, perfectly dressed, perfectly capable. He could have been, you didn't know where he was going to work. If I would have thought he was a law professor or a, um, a, a doctor, or I mean, in those times, I know that would have been hard, but mm -hmm. his persona, and then when you see him as a conductor, and I think we've all ridden those trains, yeah. um, he so much wanted to escape that world and become better. And his father, the words that were used throughout the movie were so appropriate by Roth. Um, when he said that he wanted um, the son to go to Howard school yeah. and that 
he was teaching at Athenia school, Greek. He was teaching Greek literature at a Greek school and they chose the word gold, golden. And he was a boxer, the golden, uh, you know, a golden boy who boxed and always won every, uh, every uh, time he boxed. Right. And then when the ashes were brought from under the bed, it was two gold boxes. Mm -hmm. And the names of the characters, I yeah. think, were so carefully thought out. Coal men, coal, C-O-A-L, uh, black, um, you know, even though he was so, uh, so silky. And the word silk, his skin was like silk. And even Fiona, I mean, that's a deer. I mean, uh, a, a fawn, uh, a deer with headlights. You know, she was so afraid of everything. And I thought the choice and play on words. And I would love to get to the word spook. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing all that stuff up about the names, because I was going to uh, ask people about that as well. But yeah, uh, uh, very interesting, you know, and uh, Silky Silk, right, is yeah. his boxing name. Yeah. Um, so right, uh, which suggests, uh, you know, you can slip and slide, right? You know, on silk, it's uh, it, it's so smooth, get, get away with anything in a way. And, right. uh, um, and so, a spook, I mean, he himself was a spook yeah. in many ways. Uh, right. Not in, just in with that, his race, in, but in way that, he did. Right, and that first definition of, right, uh, you know, who is he really? He's not really there, right? right. The, the, uh, uh, the beginning of the movie is about characters who are not really there. Right. The, uh, the, these two students who don't show up for class, but he's not really there either. So, exactly. so, um, so yeah, and, uh, that use of the word spook is, is very important and evocative throughout the movie, right? Um, and, and we're all sort of uh, haunting our lives, right? <laughs> um, all, all of the characters, right? They're, they're not really inhabiting life exactly. They're, they're, you know, haunted, perhaps, but but I like the way I said it first, you know, they're haunting their own lives, you know, they're, they're creating these situations themselves in some ways, you know, they are. Um, okay, now Miriam Gerber, and you're going to have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, perhaps the stain is on humanity, the human stain, mm -hmm. that we have been, we have set up a system here and other places as well, but particularly in this country, in which we put people in a position where they want to change their identity or have a, such, a, such trouble with an identity that they would give up their family, that they would give up their selves, that they would put themselves in that kind of a position just to pretend to be white. Okay, that's one thing. Then, or the humanity that's stained when we send men to war, that a man comes back and is, you know, has been made to, he said, well, didn't you send me to kill people? That's what I did. Um, the, for me, part of that whole, this whole movie, was everybody there was having a problem with their own identity. And um, it seems that we have to go back to what is humanity and what is, what is the responsibility of those who would cause others to be so troubled. Yeah. And the, the sense that we, we put so much stock in the sense in a, a thing that is completely a human creation, right? Race, you know, which, which obviously at, at the margins of, of race, you know, people pass all the time, right? Uh, and I, I'm, you know, I, there, there's a, um, a, a book, uh, it's several years old now, but it's called How Jews Became White People which is uh, just sort of an interesting thing, right? I mean, at the start of the NAACP, right, the, the colored people um, included Jews, right? And there's no question I mean, that, you know, I, I told people often I grew up next door to a golf course that wouldn't have me as a member, you know, but it was also in a town that was a sunset town. 
uh, blacks weren't allowed in the town after sunset. I was a kid. Now that that didn't apply to Jews even then. We lived there, but uh, uh, but we weren't allowed in the in on the golf course, right? So um, so gradually that that idea changes. Uh, the first several presidents of the NAACP are Jews. The last one uh, uh, was Kivi Kaplan, who was actually at my bar mitzvah because uh, he was a friend of my mother's, uh, my father's. So, um, but. Uh, um, you know, it's so the, this sort of change where uh, that comes about over time, and some of it, of course, is economic, and some of it is social. Uh, there, there's a lot of different things that go into this, but the point is that, that I was trying to make is that race is a human creation, right? Um, you know, and and then then we come up with the rules for it, as the Nazis came up with rules for who was a Jew, and as uh, in American history, you know, came up with the the amount of blood, you know, that a person has that uh, makes them of one race or another, right? So, and in the the sort of new, uh, um, you know, racist ideology in America, there's a sort of a um, there there. People like, uh, you know, people are trying to sort of steer away from the Jewish part of this because for a variety of reasons, they're trying to uh, uh, clean up racism in a certain way, which, you know, has always been the case. So um, the, these changes in terminology and things that get used in the right wing press and stuff like that has, uh, um, you know, de-emphasized religion and emphasized race. So... Um, you know. So remember, uh, Catholics were not welcome in the Ku Klux Klan either. So we're pointing out. So, um, so but but yeah, I mean the 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 stain that we have created, absolutely. There are other thoughts. Um. Oh, Elaine, go ahead. I and keep thinking. Then thinking about the scene where he is having a conversation with his mother and they're talking about the color of his children and would she be allowed to see the children it was a heavy duty scene and then yeah. he goes to kiss her goodbye and she pulls away from him and she does i'm wondering could she have had a relation with a white man at some point that he could have been part white yeah they're and, they're the 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 movie doesn't uh, the movie is a little ambiguous about that. Let's say, um, you know, uh, uh, in the scene uh, uh, with his father, I mean, the the father actually kind of says, you know, if I was your father, I would say, <laughs> oh, right, um, yeah. you know, but but the implication also is that yeah, I am your father, and I'm saying, right. Uh, but so there's a little, uh, little ambiguity in that. Um, so is there anything in the book that mentions that at all? You know, it's been a long time since I've read it. So I, I uh, not that I can recall. Uh, and I don't think we're really supposed to, you know, think that the mother wasn't faithful or something like that. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I mean, there plenty of African American authors have written about the the difference between light and darker skin within the African American community, uh, and what that means, and, and sort of uh, the hierarchy even within the African American community about this, which is something that uh, um, you know some some have uh, fought against in a sense over the years. Uh, interestingly, for some reason, on uh, one of the cable stations, they've been showing uh, the documentary about the boxing match between. Uh, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in Zaire. Uh, and there's a lot that comes out about that, um, uh, you know, about uh, the darkness of George Foreman compared to the lighter skin of Muhammad Ali and, uh, and what that meant in Africa. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's called When We Were Kings, uh, a pretty interesting documentary, uh, um, you know, if you get a chance to catch it. But, but some of that stuff is, is very much a part of the African-American community as well. And then, yeah, the, the scene with the mother in the restaurant, right, where she talks about uh, 
you know, how this is going to work. You know, there'll be, uh, um, you know, a couple of years, a couple of years from now, we'll, you'll walk them past me in their Sunday best in a train station, right? You know, um, something like that. So it's, uh, it's very powerful. Um, we have Julie, then Mary, and then Alice. Julie, go ahead. Um, I thought it was interesting that, I mean, the, the character, at least to me, seemed like he clearly was wanted to pass as white, but back in, in that time, is Jewish really white? And so if, he's, if he feels like he can pass as white, pass as white, like why does he choose to become Jewish? And I know the connection with the boxing guy, but that, you know, that could have been something different. So I just thought that was really interesting. And then also at the very end that they're saying Kaddish, you know, over him and like, how does he even like have any real connection with, you know, the, the culture and, and all of that. So I just thought that was an interesting choice. And the, the other thing I'll just say is I felt like there was so much dialogue happening or so much happening in the film between Philip Roth and his issues and angst you know this being one of them and yeah. I, I when I read the book I didn't know any of this you know Mishigas about Philip Roth Roth um mm -hmm. and and when I watched this film I literally was like oh my god just like watching him sort of literally be a misogynist and you know all the stuff in his own work it was just right. really fascinating so yeah it, it is and uh, the character that Gary Sinise plays, Nathan Zuckerman, is a character that recurs in Philip Roth novels. Uh, he's in at least four, I think, uh, maybe more. I mean, including one where it's in, in at least one where it's in the title, uh, Zuckerman Unbound, I think, right? Um, but but the character of Nathan Zuckerman appears over and over, and he is sort of the alter ego of Philip Roth. Uh, Roth, I'm sure if he were alive would say, well, he's not exactly me, you know, but, but he certainly has a lot in common with, with Philip Roth and, and deliberately so. So, um, so, um, and, and uh, you know, Roth, Roth uh, was certainly introspective enough to know what he was, I think, <laughs> uh, you know, which is not to defend him. I mean, it's, it, you know, uh, he did believe in the precision of language, think, but but you know certainly his behavior in life was was uh, not ideal, you know. But but and so Zuckerman is a character that uh, he creates that's warts and all. But you're right. I mean, uh, Roth throughout his career is sort of playing out his own issues in his writing, right? You know, so so it translates into the movie as well. Uh, um mary and then alice okay i have two comments to make number one we haven't talked about this but the whole issue with class when he takes um his you know his girlfriend or whatever to a nice restaurant and introduces her to gary Sneed, she couldn't handle it and said how can you do this to me she was not comfortable crossing class lines mm -hmm. um in and being you know being in that situation and so there's, there's a class issues in life, right? Not mm -hmm. comfortable, not comfortable just living a life out in the world, too. Right. And out but in the world. And also that restaurant was pretty, you know, uh, was, was upscale. He didn't take her to, you know, the coffee shop down the street and have a burger. I mean, it was a, you know, very. And he, he again, he sprung the person on her just like he did with his original girlfriend. He's he because he somehow he can't quite get it together himself to make the proper transitions and give people information. Um, but there was a class issue there and she had a class, you know, she came from supposedly a rich background, but it wasn't rich because she wasn't raised that way because she left at 14 and she, you know, worked the streets, that kind of thing. And so it was sort of, that was sort of another layer to this. Um, and the other thing is that I, I read, um, a, a, Okay, it was in a review of the movie because I went and looked at it was a couple of reviews. Um, when the New Yorker reviewed the movie when it was first made, mm -hmm. they attributed the whole thing with the professor, you know, and 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 having, you know, saying the uh, race, you know, the spook thing to um, 
to to something in his life that that hadn't happened. And he actually he he wrote a whole article in New Yorker in response saying, no, that was the spook thing came from. I had a professor at Princeton who who said inadvertently something that was considered racist. And it took him about he was pardoned, but it took about two years right. to get through this. And it was very disturbing and it was and it, and it really made an impression on me. So I think that the going back to how personal is this? How much is this Philip Roth? Who, who the narrator? Is he Philip Roth? All Zuckerman, all those things are all intertwined in, in the novel, which I think makes it really a rich, interesting thing to, you know, piece of, yeah. of literature or a film. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, Alice. Yeah, I just want to just discuss a little bit about talking about the father and whether he was the father and the, the whiteness of the son. And um, Bob and I have been watching, you know, the Professor Gates show, Finding Your Roots. And when he, um, when he looks into the genealogy of African-Americans, they almost all have huge amounts of European lineage, um, you know, some more than others. And so, you know, that, you know, I don't think all that DNA stuff was around when Philip Roth wrote this, but it just, for me, it resonated because, you know, of course, there's all these different, there's this range of African American, there's a range of all of us, you know, and um, so, you know, I just thought that was interesting looking at it from, you know, 2022 um, perspective that, yeah, I mean, his children, it looked, they didn't have children, but his children could have been very black. They could have been very white. You know, that's <laughs> the way this genetics works. Right, right. Yeah, you, you just don't know. Uh, um, there, there's a couple of lines that, that stand out that I just want to mention uh, in relation to that. Uh, the use of the phrase lily white face. Uh, comes up a couple of times in this movie, right? The, the first time we hear it, I think, is when he's visiting the, the attorney. Uh, and he's talking to them about, you know, some kind of lawsuit uh, against the, uh, the, the college, right? Um, you know, um, and, and the lawyer advises him again, this is evocative of the very first scene where he's talking about Achilles. Um, and, you know, all Achilles has to do to avoid the war is give up the girl, right? And that that's what uh, that's what the lawyer advises him to. He says, "Give up the girl." And Coleman Silk gets mad and says, "I don't want to see you or your smug lily white face again." So when do we hear that again? Uh, in a flashback scene that comes later in the movie when his brother Walt comes to see him and tells him you know, you're, you're not part of the family anymore, all right? And he says, I never want to see your lily white face again. So, so it, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's a very literary text and, and very beautifully intertwined, both the, the, the classics, Achilles, the classics, Professor, and the, this term lily white face. And I might parallel that with the black crow, um, which, <laughs> uh, you know, which is an interesting sort of thing too where you know you've got Fanya saying I'm a crow right you know so um so th th there's just uh you know some of this is so poetic that it, it defies sort of easy interpretation I think you know but 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 I think that, that that's fa fascinating that she uh um she identifies with this you know coal black creature right so um uh, you know, may, maybe not because of its blackness, certainly, but but it's, um, you know, what does she identify with, right? Uh, it's 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 being in a cage. Uh, she identifies with that particular crow that's in a cage. Yeah. Um, she uh, identify uh, with with the sort of um, you know, what do crows do, right? They they feast on carrion and things like that you know that she's not um you know she she's not sort of directly involved in life she picks up after it 
uh, which is what she does, right? I mean, that's what she does at the college and at the farm, right? So um, not really living forward, but uh, but picking on the, the bones of what's gone before. So, um, so a, a very poetic. Yeah, we have Marilyn and then Linda. Um, it's interesting that um, the uh, idea that uh, the um, character uh, as a young, she was, he was like in his half, she was half his, her, the lover was half his age. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost as if he um, used her like uh, an older man would use a young woman, but she really did fall in love with him. And as much as she pretended to be illiterate, when she spoke to him, she could express her feelings at one point when she got she trusted him. Mm -hmm. That scene where she told about her whole life and how she became this way. So we were able to put the puzzle pieces together. And then it was really fascinating, as you say, about the crow, because here was a crow in a cage that didn't know how to crow. And here she was in life and she didn't know or want to uh, after being so abused. And then of course, losing two children. I mean, she it was such a sad uh, character. Yeah. And um, it's interesting, most recently, there was a study at University of Washington. There's a professor, um, I think it's a professor. He's an environmental um, uh, professor in science. Um, and he found out that crows, this is very interesting, like mammals can tell the feelings of a human being if you're sad or if you're happy, they react to it. Mm -hmm. And she, she expressed this, her feelings to him. And this crow has the capacity or any crow to uh, interact with humans feelings. And so they did studies where they wore masks happy masks and sad masks and they studied crows and um so it was interesting when they put this into the film um linda did you have a comment all i was going to say was i was going to mention what marilyn mentioned that the crow could not crow anymore and that crow had also been broken in a way you know all of the main characters as i said I found were not completely whole. They all had their issues and the crow was synonymous with the gal. So that's all I was gonna say. So Marilyn yeah. said lovely, so thank you. That's great. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, I think that scene actually yeah, where she spends the night just this once and then they have kind of, an, she has an explosion at breakfast and then goes off to see the crow that, that that's actually a really interesting sort of turning point in the movie, a kind of a, uh, where she becomes a little more proactive in life uh, and their relationship changes as a result of that. And there is a, a, a moment of actual happiness for the two of them, you know, which of course is ended by being run off the road, right? Um, so uh, so it's, an, it, it's, um, if you like, th this movie is a Greek tragedy, you know, or a Shakespearean tragedy or something uh, of that ilk, right? Where the, you know, uh, um, where, where the, the possibility exists of the characters finding their way out of this mess and they don't, you know, the essence of tragedy, right? So, so we're back to the fact that the whole thing has this sort of uh, structure of a classic. Uh, from a uh, European Eurocentric point of view. Um, so I, I think that, that that's um, so the, the, the fascinating sort of structure to the whole thing. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm glad you, you guys seem to like it and absorb it. Uh, I, I wasn't Are we have time? Sure. Right. Um, Sandy has her hand up. Go ahead, Sandy. Okay. Going back to your mention of the book Patrimony, I just loved that book. 
Yeah. It brought me to tears. I didn't know you were in it. I didn't know you were the rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> it's really yeah. like I said, it's a composite. It's a co composite of me and of my classmate, uh, Morris Barzilai, who was the rabbi there after me. So with know. Morris, who actually officiated at Herman's funeral, but I was the rabbi who visited him in the hospital. So, or rabbinic those, students were both students at the time. For yeah. those of us who might have had a difficult or even a wonderful relationship with our fathers, but especially those who might have had a difficult one. Yeah. It's really a beautiful book. Um, I, I loved it and it's short. So I, I would advise anyone who hasn't read it to get it out of the library and read it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It, uh, it's one of my favorites of his. Uh, um, and I will also say that the women in that congregation made a point of telling me that Phil Broth's mother was nothing like the mothers that he wrote about in books. So well, we uh, would certainly hope that for God's yeah, sake. They wanted, she had already passed away by that time. So I never got a chance to meet her. Right. So, but, but they were, they were very uh, insistent that I should know. Good. So, yeah. um, listen, I echo Carla. She said, this has been an interesting conversation, but has Alicia been rescued? Uh, yes, actually, I got a text in the middle. Uh, what does it say? Uh, I'm out. That's all it says. That's so, all we need to know, really. Yeah. Right? And you didn't share that? You've got her picture in the background, and that's <laughs> all I can think of. <laughs> and the conversation was just amazing. I really have enjoyed it. Yeah, great. Well, it's nice you. to see you. So um, just to remind everyone that next week is Little White Lie. And um, that, by the way, is a documentary. Make sure you get the right and film. And this is, this is it, right? Yeah, Lacey that's, Schwartz. That's yeah, it. Yeah, Lacey Schwartz. And, and I, I don't think I have to say anything about why I paired it with, with, with this movie. When you see it, you'll know. You know. So, but, but it is the only documentary that I've put on this whole, whole list of, I don't know how many films we've done now, but this is, this is the uh, first documentary. Uh, and I thought it just paired with this very well. So. Uh, take uh, take a look i hope you like it right um also this weekend is rabbi alan setcher um next weekend is rabbi rick jacobs on super sunday and you can order your locks boxes okay not to florida um carla and enrique they're they're delicious and we i wish i could get that to you but we can't and that's actually david in the background isn't it oh david sorry oh, my nephew david hey hi david all right. All right. So it's good seeing everyone. If you have any questions, let me know and um, have a great day. Thank you. All. It's nice Bye. to see you.